All righty. Well, we're just about at time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So first off, thank you all so much for joining us. We're super thrilled to see such a great turnout for today's webinar, Building and Maintaining Strong Student Relationships Remotely. Uh, so this webinar is part of the larger Getting the Most Out of Turnitin Feedback Studio series. And we're, ex we're excited to continue the series today with a great discussion around just some you know, best practices around remote learning and then also how you can use Feedback Studio to support remote learning to ensure that you, know, you continue to engage students and really provide meaningful instruction at a distance as the education world you know, continues to grapple with the impact of COVID-19. So yeah, my name is Andy Miller. I work on the product marketing team here at Turnitin and I'll be your host today. And um, it's my distinct honor to you know, be joined by a great distinguished panel of educators as well as an awesome moderator who's gonna be running our discussion today. Um, so I'd like to take a moment for them to quickly introduce themselves. So Dr. Paul Sparks, why don't we start with you? Good morning, I'm, I'm Paul Sparks. Uh... I'm a professor of learning technology at Pepperdine University. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sydney Hankerson. I am the resource science teacher at Rockville High School in Montgomery County, Maryland. Besides leading the science department, I also teach chemistry and physics at Rockville High. Hi everyone, my name is Julie Brand. I'm a Canadian and international educator. Uh, most recently, I've been at the Lukai International School in the Bahamas as the head of the English department. And before that, I was at John F. Kennedy, the American School of Theater Zero in Mexico. And hi everyone, I'm Kristen Van Gompel, Andy's turn-in counterpart for this webinar. I'm on the Teaching and Learning Innovations team, and my role is to provide pedagogical expertise to the products that we serve you at Turnitin. Um, I'm also a former elementary school teacher and have experience as an instructor for education courses in higher education. And as Andy mentioned, I will be your moderator for today's session. Great, okay, thanks so much all. Um, so a couple quick housekeeping items before we get started. So today, during today's webinar, all of your lines will be muted, um, but we really do encourage you to participate throughout today's session. So the best way to do that is actually to submit your questions in the Q&A box. You'll see that at the bottom of your Zoom interface. I also have the Q&A button there on the slide so you can you know, easily locate that. Um, feel free to send your questions as they come up, send them throughout today's session, and we'll be sure to leave some time at the end to uh, address and answer all those questions. And then finally, today's webinar is being recorded, so that will be sent out in the follow-up email um, within 20 to four, 24 to 48 hours. Um, so you feel free to share that webinar or that recording around with you know, your colleagues who weren't able to join us live today. So for most of you are probably familiar with Turnitin, but for those of you who are not, you know, really what we're all about or our mission is really to ensure the integrity of global research in education. And so one way that we do this, accomplish this mission is through our flagship solution, Turnitin Feedback Studio. Um, so Feedback Studio is a similarity checking, feedback and grading solution, you know, that provides a lot of benefits to institutions as well as instructors and students. So first and foremost, it really helps, you know, schools and institutions to safeguard their reputation. Um, but it also saves instructors lots of time providing feedback and grading student work. And then it also helps students to really, you know, cultivate writing excellence and feel confident moving to that next stage in their academic journey or, you know, potentially entering the workforce for the first time. Um, yeah, so again, super excited to have you all here today. And now I will uh, pass it over to Kristen to kick off our conversation. Kristen? Sure. Thanks, Andy. Okay, so to just help set the stage for today's conversation, let's just talk about where we are in education a little bit. And Andy kind of touched on this earlier. So as we know, educators are across the globe are shifting to more technology enabled environments, hybrid or remote learning settings due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. And with this comes many challenges. We have, we're learning new technologies, new classroom management strategies, and new ways to build relationships with students. And research supports that strong, that strong students relationships is correlated with positive outcomes in their school success. So it is really crucial that we focus on the relationship building aspect um, of learning, especially in our current situation. 
However, building those relationships from a distance does require some modifications to what we may have already been doing in our classrooms. So our panel today, consisting of these three very knowledgeable educators, will discuss strategies for managing those relationships with students um, in these new environments, maybe not new for everyone, but new for some people, learning environments. Um, and as a moderator, I will be posing questions to our panelists in which they will share their responses. And as Andy mentioned, if you ever have a question throughout, throw them in the chat window and we'll have some time at the end, hopefully to cover some of your questions. Uh, as you can see here, we have some, oh, it looks like a little messed up, but essential questions um, for our discussion to help guide it today. So just to touch on here, um, we're gonna be talking about supporting the social and emotional well-being of our students, creating safe learning spaces, communication strategies, as well as leveraging technology. And Andy will be posting these questions in the chat window as a reminder as we go through and address each question, because we're actually gonna take the, the whole slides off and you'll just see us talking for the next few minutes. <laughs> okay, great. So yeah, I'll stop the share now and we'll uh, start our discussion. Great, okay. So before digging into those questions, I think it would be helpful to provide just a little more context about experiences and learning settings from our panelists. So would each of you please briefly share your experience um, in working with students in hybrid or remote settings? Yes, um, I've been obviously around a while. I've been teaching at Pepperdine for for 20 years and the <laughs> Uh, Kristen is one of our, our stars and um, we, uh, I've been doing the online and blended format for 20 years. So we, we were in the front of the first programs to get started with that. Before I taught high school, before uh, this is back in 1984, before we were thinking too much about online. And then in between there were 10 years of uh, uh, doing internet and aerospace, uh, working with aerospace companies. Thank you. I'm going to discuss my experience before March 13th, 2020, and after March 13th, 2020. And the reason I'm using the date March 13th was because that was the last day for Maryland Public Schools uh, for us to have in-person instruction with our students. Prior to March 13th, uh, my experience with um, with remote learning kind of centered around credit recovery for high school students. So we used um, programs such as Admentum, which is previously, previously most of you probably known as Ed Options, to work with our students. The only time we communicated with them really if they were submitting assignments on time and that was uh, primarily through emails. So it wasn't a lot of interaction like through Zoom or Google uh, Meets as we are doing now. Post March 13th, um, a lot of, from my standpoint, in terms of being able to lead my science department, there's been a great deal of coaching and also working with PLCs in terms of implementing what the county and district want as far as remote learning. Also, working with those teachers and individuals who weren't really prepared for this. None of us was really prepared, but many within the department and also schools have flipped their classrooms. So that transition was a lot easier for them. But for many, the technology, they were extremely behind in terms of using platforms such as Canvas or uh, Google Classroom. So they had to come up to speed uh, rather quickly in, in terms of being able to provide content to students. So working and coaching with those particular individuals and the PLCs, ensuring that fidelity is met uh, with the content that is given to the students. Um, and also for myself uh, as a science teacher, trying to provide that curiosity with the students where they're not uh, bored and being able to use the tools and resources at their own house where they could actually do some science experiments as well. Um, so just trying to keep it engaged and trying to keep it um, a little exciting for the students, even though their world was turned upside down just overnight. 
Okay, um, so I've had some experience prior also to March 13th. Uh, first of all, I used to teach ESL classes online and do small group and individual tutoring online um, in the afternoons. And then we had a nice, uh, well, a surprise visitor to the Bahamas. Uh, early in this last school year, we had Hurricane Dorian hit us, um, which ended up with a huge majority of our students being displaced. So some were evacuated off the island, some continued school remotely, while others, our school was able to get up and back and running within five to six days. So we had kids at um, remote campuses. We had three different campuses. Some were people's houses. One was a hotel. Um, so we gave classes in class and then had this hybrid model where we were online teaching for the students who were in a variety of places around the world. Some students have returned to their home countries. Others were staying with relatives, maybe with grandma who didn't understand internet at all. Um, so that was a bit of a prep for us in the Bahamas uh, for what we did not know would be coming. Again, March 13th, just like Sydney. So when March 13th rolled around, all of my IB diploma students were online, um, as well as all the IGCSE students. We were teaching the English IGCSE model as well. Great, thank you. It helps to know where each of you are coming from and answering these questions and your unique perspectives. So let's start with the first question. And since we are talking about relationship building, um, Let's, let's begin by talking about the social and emotional needs of our students. So my question for you is, can you share some insights or strategies about how educators can support the social and emotional well-being of our students in remote learning settings? Uh, yes, uh, I'll start. Um, and first, uh, thanks to uh, Kristen and, and Andrew. Uh, I. Uh, uh, speak with a lot of people and everyone wants to know how technology is going to save the world. And it's, it's really not about technology. It's, it's about relationships with students. And, and so uh, it's, it's nice to have that focus for once and focus on what, what really matters. In, in my experience over, well, you know, too many years, uh, one reality comes uh, very, very, true to me or, or speaks really true to me and that is people learn what they care about from people they care about who care about them. So the more that I understand and support the notion that learning is a collaborative effort, learning happens in community, uh, the the more that I'm successful in, in, in my work. Now, uh, maybe everyone out there understands that already, but to the extent that, that you don't, now is a good time with the, the COVID happening that we concentrate on those sorts of things because going online really highlights what's happening in classrooms or, or what should be happening in classrooms. Uh, I hear from uh, friends teaching high school online that they they that they're really struggling to have students check in with them and, and do assignments, et cetera. <clears throat> and so I've suggested that build, building those relationships. So, so that's, the, that's the model, that's the uh, ideal. It can get impossible. I, I remember having up to 85, 90 students in a semester and how do you have a, a relationship with, with all of those students? So. It's an ideal, it's in some ways an impossibility, but it's something that we need to strive for in some ways and, and maybe use technology to help us do that. I just, just got a new book yesterday, I wanted to show everybody, no more teaching without positive relationships. This is so, so important. And uh, the, uh, there's lots of, lots of ways to do that, right? Uh, Take what you have been doing in, in regular classrooms, which is what, how I transitioned into online and blended teaching, and, and try to do that on online, right? So we have small groups, uh, critical friends, learning circles, all of these ideas that have been tested and found to be true in, in classrooms can be done online. Uh, Zoom provides uh, you know, breakout rooms and there's, 
also lots of other things uh, to try. We've gotten really creative at Pepperdine and even held classes in World of Warcraft. One of our uh, creative instructors uh, decided to have everyone jump into the, the uh, gaming platform, find an avatar, and then they, he got them all together in a cave and that's where they, <laughs> they had class. I'm sure high school students out there might, might get a kick out of that. Uh, but but be creative. We we uh, um, the, but the main thing is to build community, and the, perhaps the most important idea is don't uh, don't feel like you've got to do all of that the heavy lifting yourself. Um, in to the extent that we can build learning communities, small groups. I'll talk a little later about Mimi Ito, um, and let a lot of that social emotional support come from peers and from other places in on the uh, on the internet from family members and peers and and uh, class classmates etc uh, i think that's a really important point going forward thank you i i can't stress the importance of social emotional learning for students in k through 12. um Hopefully, prior to the COVID world, that has been a focus uh, for schools and, and teachers. Um, if not, it has to be critical and centered in this COVID virtual reality that we're in right now. Um, the focus on social emotional learning has to be um, mentioned when you're creating your lesson plans. Um, it has to be mentioned when uh, you're developing your master schedule itself. Uh, one of the things I'm a proponent of is um, dealing with advisory periods. And advisory periods gives you the opportunity to be able to have social emotional learning school-wide. Um, so if that is something that many schools, especially in the, on the West Coast, um, they are familiar with advisory periods, um, they have implemented advisory periods, and it does seem like uh, advisory periods is more of a middle school uh, type thing, but truly you can expand it to the high schools. Uh, if for those of you, I would suggest that you go to YouTube and watch a video is called Numb by Liv McNeil. Um, it's a high school student and just basically she just sits there in this COVID world and goes through what learning is gonna be like for her. Um, and it's very open, uh, it opened my eyes a lot because this is what my son who is starting high school is probably going to experience. It's gonna be a lot of loneliness. Um, even though the students are texting one another, they're chatting with each, with each other on various means of social media, they don't have that physical interaction that they need. Um, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics in late June, they issued a very controversial statement saying we want in-person schools to occur in the fall. And this, this center around this was the social emotional well-being of students. So many school districts have decided to go virtual. We have to figure out a way to do that. I would suggest if schools itself do not have within their master schedule that time frame of having advisory periods or it's too late to do that, then teachers themselves can actually have mindful moments within their class periods. That could occur at the beginning of the class period where you'll take some time to do some breathing exercises or within your uh, middle to time uh, class period, which is really good, especially during the middle of the class period to kind of break up that monotony of uh, learning and kind of give the students kind of a moving break, etc. cetera, uh, or kind of like towards the end, just kind of do a check in terms of where are the students at. Um, having six, seven, eight periods, uh, or maybe four if they're doing block, that's, that's a lot. It's a lot in terms of uh, the content, uh, the teachers are doing it differently. Hopefully there's a little bit more um, continuity throughout the school so the students aren't facing that stress. And you're also looking at what's going on at home. We don't know. The school building itself was a safe environment for students. 
since the school environment, the building isn't there. So we have to figure out a way to make school for students. And we're gonna to have to do that virtually. So if you haven't looked at trying to uh, implement mindful movements within uh, your, uh, I wouldn't say content, within your lessons, I would um, encourage you to go out and research mindful movements and how you can implement that within your, um, within your class period itself. So please, please, please do not just focus on content and scope and sequence. This is very vital for the health and well-being of our students. I really agree with Sydney. I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. I was lucky enough to work at two schools um, that had social emotional um, curriculum and learning for everyone. Um, in the high school in Mexico, we had a mentoring program that was school-wide, um, and it was not just the teachers involved. It was every adult that worked in the school. And, you know, we were all responsible for a group of students, and the idea was those students knowing that somebody cared about them, that somebody knew them, that there was somebody there that they could turn to for guidance and advice. Um, so I strongly agree. I know the one in the Bahamas, we did a formative advisory. We had homeroom periods. Um, and when we went online, those homeroom periods were a wonderful part of all of our days. They were a chance for us to chat, to goof around, to check up on each other. Um, and so that kind of tied into my experience that we had had earlier in the year. Um, when we had the hurricane come through our island, just for the magnitude of this, it was a category five hurricane and 70% of our island was underwater. Um, so in the six days that it took us to get a place for the high school students to, to have a classroom, I sat researching madly, trying to think, how am I gonna stand before these students? 25% of them have just lost everything they have in the world. They had the clothes on their backs and nothing else. Um, and it was, I, I found it really overwhelming, but then I ended up finding a lot of information on trauma-informed trauma classroom and trauma-informed practices um, that I was able to bring with me as a tool to help connect with the students, to help them, you know, process through what they had gone through, um, and, and then that I was able to use that virtually as well. So when you're looking at trauma-informed practices, uh, Howard Bath has three tenets of trauma-informed care, which are safety, connection, and emotional regulation. So like what Sydney said, I'm really hoping that the majority of us were probably doing that already. Maybe not consciously though. So I think that's the difference with trauma-informed practices is that you're being very conscious about how you do that and how you work that into every lesson and every day for the students. So one of the ways you can make that connection with students informally are things like doing daily check-ins, whether it's in the morning or the afternoon. Even if your school doesn't have that formal program, um, this is a way that teachers can do it. So I did a lot of uh, flip grid. I'm not sure how much my students loved it by the end, um, but they definitely had some fun with it. Uh, flip grid allows the students to record videos. It's kind of like a YouTube platform that is more uh, private. So you can have it just so the students can see each other's or just so the teacher can see theirs um, and nobody else in the larger public can see that. Um, but it allows students to, to leave a video response, to type, uh, respond to each other as well. Did a lot of Google Forms and Survey Monkeys when I did quick polls with them. Um, emoji selection, so I'd have a Google slide of the day and they'd all pop up the emoji um, representing kind of how they felt that day. Or uh, drawing or, you know, word of the day or hashtag of the day onto a Google slide. Um, and sometimes we just have a guided chat on Google Meet because I had a lot of very quiet, shy students. So just giving them the kind of prompt where they were able to either answer in chat or answer verbally um, to just kind of share where they were at during the day and then allow them the chance to respond to each other. Um, in a more formal setting, you can also do like virtual journals or interactive notebooks. Um, I did a lot of that in elementary school where the kids would write a journal every day and I'd respond to it every day. 
Uh, so it's that kind of idea, but turned virtually, where you can use things like Google Slides, each student um, having their own slide that they use throughout the semester. Even if you just do it once a week is a more formal option. Remember, you're tying in those writing, as an English teacher, you're tying in those writing pro practices. Um, so it's helpful in every subject with the students. Um, and that can be subject-based, but it can also just be social-emotional based. Um, and then, you know, when you're looking at trauma-informed practices, part of that is the student being able to process the experience. And when the research shows that when adversity feels like a more of a shared experience, it's easier for students to, to cope with that. So I always... I always promote being very authentic with my students. And of course, as a teacher, there's a line of professionalism that we have to uphold, but there's also a line of being real with them and showing them. I mean, COVID-19 affected us as well. They're now in our living rooms just as much as we're in you know, their houses. Um, and that's a very different dynamic for them. Um, I found giving them narrative writing, and that helps particularly in the English language classroom, um, being able to have students write or express themselves. And by that, I mean, we need to kind of expand our ideas of what a text is. So that can be video, that can be drawing, um, that can be just an audio or, you know, all the way up to a formal essay, but allowing students to have those options of expressing their emotions, whether it's fictional or a fiction, nonfiction type thing. Uh, we did a lot of memoir writing with my students. Um, and even, you know, I, for a final project in June, after three or four months of online learning, my students were still processing the hurricane. The memoirs were all hurricane based. They were able to, you know, finally put into perspective things that had happened months earlier um, to express themselves. And I had the students um, in their reflections and also a few parents that emailed in after and said, this was so important to give them a space to express their ideas and emotions. Um, so as we move into the new school year, you know, not a lot of our students had time or teachers had time to process what happened last year. It was one day to the next for many, many districts and many schools where all of a sudden we're, oh, you're online. And everybody just had to deal with a new normal. Um, so now that we've had this summer break, it, it may be the time to refocus and to allow students to, to express their emotions and their, their feelings about where they are today and what they've been through. Thank you all. Uh, each of you touched upon the importance of feeling safe and school as a safe space. And I'd like to hone in on that idea a little bit more because um, it's critical. So. Can you just share a little bit more about what feeling safe in a remote setting looks like? Um, any strategies or suggestions for other educators? Uh, do you want me to start? Sure, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say feeling safe is being able to provide students, uh, first of all, with classroom the classroom management that you normally would have like the first day you you want to have those expectations and norms as well in the remote learning um, that will help guide the students they're going to still need that focus they're going to still need that guidance from you as the uh, instructor as their teacher uh, to kind of help them along the way to ease some of their stress so they know when to uh, turn in their assignments or how to turn their assignments or to due dates etc. Um, typical classroom management skills that you will teach them in the classroom you will also need to make sure you provide them those strategies uh, online as well. If you don't provide them with those virtual strategies, they're going to become lost. Not only are they going to be lost, they're going to be disengaged. And it's going to be very difficult for you to capture them again. I think Dr. Sparks spoke about that earlier. Pretty hard to get those students engaged. So if you are able to, for the first couple of weeks, I would probably say, uh, first two weeks or so, just work on 
the expectations. You want to make sure that clarity is there. And then you move into your content a little bit more. And those first two weeks are also very good, just going back to the social emotional piece, in terms of working on some mindfulness strategies um, that might be very, that you will want to implement within your lessons as well. So for the safe place, being able to talk about the norms, the expectations, how we're going to address each other uh, through chat rooms, how we're going to, if, depending on your, your district policy, um, the breakout rooms and Zooms, if you're um, able to use those, uh, how we're going to interact with one another, um, how student discourse is going to be done. Um, all of that needs to be uh, upfront with the students and that everyone needs to be on the same page. So spend more time on that the first couple of weeks rather than jumping straight into the content. I, I think that will kind of ease some of the anxiety for the students. And I also believe for many parents as well. Um, if they, uh, the parents will speak with their child about, hey, what's going on in the classroom, how you're going to uh, conduct yourself in a particular manner. So if the student has a very good grasp of this is how we're going to do this English class, this is the work we're expected to do in social studies, uh, this is what we're supposed to do when we're working in small groups, et cetera, then I believe the parents will, uh, their anxiety will probably go down a little bit more um, in terms of this virtual learning world that we're living in. Um, so I'd like to just touch exactly on what Sydney was talking about um, with that familiarity and creating that safe environment um, with the students. So when we're looking at that, I think it's really important we all, as educators, you know, we get drilled into us Bloom's taxonomy, Bloom's taxonomy. Um, it's also really important to take a look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If our students' needs aren't being met, we're not going to be able to teach to them. Um, I had a really great professor during my master's class, Marge Taizuba, and she wrote a book that I would strongly recommend to everybody. I'm just going to hold up my phone here with a Amazon here. It's called The Wish I Could Have Told You, um, Portraits of Teenagers Almost Dropping Out. And uh, she was an educator on Chicago's South Side for many years. And she brought that knowledge to me um, when I was working at a very high socioeconomic school, um, high achieving school in central Mexico. And those ideas and theories apply to every student. Um, if students don't have their needs and their feeling of safety met, they're not able to learn, they're not able to retain new information, um, and they're not able to take risks in their learning. They're, if they don't feel safe, they're not gonna take risks. And we need them, as educators, we need them to take risks in order to get to that next level and that deeper understanding. Uh, one of my good friends in Mexico actually has started a project for educators called the Failure Project. Um, and the mission is to take risks, embrace failures, share, and inspire. That idea that even as educators who were supposed to know everything, or at least the kids think we do, maybe, um, <laughs> that you know, we, we still fail. I, many times I always, again, go back to authenticity with my students. You know, I tried this out. Well, this was supposed to work this way. It didn't work. Um, many, many times online, our mistakes are up there in their faces. They're waiting for us to load videos or to get the slides up the way we want them. Um, so I think just being really open and honest with them and showing them that we too make mistakes and it's okay and you can learn from them and move forward is a great way to, to get them to take those risks. Um, and then kind of less formally, one thing I love doing is being really goofy with my students. Um, having formerly been a early elementary educator, uh, no problem dressing up in costumes in my classroom. Um, I know some schools were doing things like crazy hat day and crazy hair day. Um, I'd like to do it with just my classroom sometimes, you know, if we were studying something, maybe everybody, you know, do your best to dress up in it. Um, and obviously students have limited resources. And again, going back to my 
situation last year. I had students with very few things. So, you know, we were like, go outside, get whatever you can from outside, bring it in, draw a picture, um, put a piece of paper on your head as a hat. Uh, whatever you can do. I know we were out in our inflatable pool inflatables out in the garden and filming ourselves. <laughs> um, so, you know, just being goofy with the students and allowing them to know that it's not everything needs to be formal. And I think Paul's probably going to talk about this a little bit later, letting kids play and, as a way of learning as well and having the freedom to do that. It's very, very important in, in them being able to take risks. Um, and then going back to what Sydney had said about consistency, consistency is absolutely important for them to feel safe. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to make it monotonous for them. So, so doing small changes, doing fun little activities within those norms that you've established is really important so that the kids don't feel numb. Um, I watched that video and it is a very powerful video to see how monotonous and lonely and isolating le online learning can be. But we as educators also know that it can be fun, it can be interactive, and it can make you feel connected. Great. Yeah, there's some wonderful resources already shared. And yeah, why not have Crazy Hot Day, you know, virtually, <laughs> whatever you have at home. Um, well, thank you. Those are incredibly valuable suggestions. Um, let's shift our focus to uh, a very important topic that we think about every day, and that's communication. So panelists, can you please share some strategies for communicating with your students? And I know some of them were shared a little bit earlier, but if we can really shift the focus on communication. Um, so how can we communicate with our students in remote learning settings? perhaps some broader strategies as well as feedback as a communication tool? Okay, I'll, I'll begin with this. I, I would say as far as communication, you, you wanna be careful with communication, especially um, in the virtual world, you wanna make sure that you protect yourself. Um, so individual contact with students, uh, I would probably limit that to any emails that could probably be traceable. Um, so you probably want to steer away from text messages. You probably want to steer away from trying to contact through um, social media, such as Messenger through Facebook, et cetera, especially in a K-12 world. You, you want to probably stay away from that. Um, it gets a lot, gets messy after a while. Um, and this is speaking from someone who was president of their local association. So I have to put that disclaimer out there. But some of the ways that um, I communicate through students uh, with students, and I've seen some of my staff members uh, com communicate with students, depends on the platforms. Last year, we had the uh, luxury of using different platforms, Canvas or Google Classroom. This year, we're just going to have to stickly, uh, uh, we have to stick strictly with Canvas. So, but either of the platforms that we use, we have the luxury of being able to communicate with students as a whole or being able to communicate with students individually as well. And we are able to provide students with feedback uh, with their assignments if need to. And we also have the opportunity to email parents as well. So that also provides us a very quick way of being able to communicate with students. Um, I would like to uh, spark students' interest. So one of the things around science is sparking curiosity. So I, I like to use Twitter as a way to spark curiosity within the entire department, whether it's something that's physical science related or life science related. So there's articles that are relevant and could be related to something that I observed or a topic that it was within the scope of sequence that students might be covering, whether it's in my class or in other classes, I'll put that topic out there. And sometimes what I'll start to notice is that students will actually bring it up within a chat. Uh, and some will steer away from what we're doing in class just to have that conversation and then make that transition in terms of what that article and, and the relevancy real world application and how's that related to the concept that we're discussing in hand. And many of times as far as that uh, students are able to understand what the concept is rather than just 
giving them the information itself. So being able to communicate through Twitter is very valuable as far as getting out that information because sometimes you don't have the time in the classroom to be able to do that whether it's in a physical classroom or as we're speaking right now in the virtual classroom. We still don't have the time to do that. So that's very valuable. Email, I would probably say use your platforms, whatever platform's giving to you. Um, and some teachers will do this. I haven't done it, but uh, being able to use Google Phone, uh, they'll get a number to call the parents to kind of update uh, parents on students' progress, especially those who are not engaging um, in turning in assignments. So teachers will actually try to call parents if they're not responding by email and kind of speak with them to see if there's any way they can try to motivate uh, the students to get the work done. So those are some of the ways that we've communicated and try to uh, get students to engage and um, within the lesson itself. I, I love the Twitter idea. And um, I'd like to slip in a, a, a larger idea that uh, it seems to keep coming up for me, and that's dark learning. So let me explain. Uh, dark matter is supposed to be 80% of the universe that we can't see, right? I feel the same way about learning. Students are learning all the time. Most of that is dark learning. It happens uh, informally, not in class. And uh, this is this is really important time. Uh, actually, John Seeley Brown wrote a great book called the The Secret Life of Information. His task was to figure out how do Xerox. He worked for Xerox Park. How do Xerox uh, Oper uh, repairmen actually learn how to fix the very complicated Xerox machines. So uh, he had a hunch that it wasn't in the training classes uh, and eventually poking around and doing his research found out that a lot of it happened by telling stories around the water cooler, which is where we get the whole sharing around the water cooler idea. So I, I think one, one way to help us in our uh, um, a quest to connect with students is, is to realize we're uh, a small part of their overall uh, electronic world, their connected world, right? They're connected in, in many, many ways. And, and how do we do that? Uh, and I think too many teachers, um, too many educators focus on just the, the classroom. How do we solve this problem? Well, we have a class, we fill the seats, we push the information out and, and that's how it works. It turns out it doesn't really work that well with human beings. Uh, we, we learn differently, and to the extent that we can figure that out, I think we do ourselves and our students um, better service. So please keep in mind, I teach at a graduate level, and uh, all of our students are, are adults. Um, the, in, in some of this may not be applicable in, in a, a K-12 setting, but uh, the number one thing that I do is just reach out and have a phone call with each student every semester. And it's amazing how just uh, 15 or 20 minutes makes all the difference in their participation in class, uh, their engagement, et cetera. Um, I've, we've had, and again, <laughs> a caveat for uh, K-12 uh, folks, uh, we've uh, held ha um, virtual happy hours where we're not teaching anything. We just have a chance for people who, for students who want to get together and just chat. And it's amazing. A lot of uh, aha moments happen during those times when there's less pressure to perform perhaps. And uh, you, you just get a, a more of a, a social and supportive uh, connection going. Um, there's, um, The, uh, there's also lots of new technology coming around. Uh, we're doing some, some work with virtual reality. I think one, one problem that we have in Zoom classes and that sort of thing is even though we're connected here, there's all this space in between. That's the setting that each, each end of the conversation is in. 
that gets in the way, right? That dog runs through, or we've all seen the the newscasters where the, the their little child walks in and and disrupts the uh, the the international uh, news report. With virtual reality, uh, you you kind of block all that. I, I realize that's uh, getting out there a little bit, and not everyone has access to access to that. But looking forward and and thinking about technology as as ways to help us to get there and, and have those conversations be more focused and meaningful. Virtual reality has been found to, to really be a, a very, very social, emotional medium. It blocks out all of the distractions and, and helps um, uh, users to, to focus on the, uh, and it's very collaborative now. Uh, we have had our students involved in virtual, um, what are called breakout rooms where they're working together to solve problems, but they are not in the same space. They are in the same virtual space through the magic of virtual reality. So just something to look forward to in the future. Thank you. Um, so just taking a couple of the ideas that I've heard from both Sydney and Paul um, and changing them a little bit. So the, the Twitter alternative, if we're not able to use social media with students, uh, we can definitely do that with teachers in our, our department. Um, but using that with students, I've used when we weren't able to use social media, uh, the Turnitin discussion boards. It has an option for a discussion board and I'll post a question. And I give the instructions to my students, much like Twitter, and limit their character numbers on there. Um, and I found it makes a much more thoughtful um, conversation between the students. Um, but I can also use it kind of as a private discussion board where it's, you know, it's still there. It's much like an email where it's traceable and everything is there and, and outlined for everybody to see. Um, but it's a little less formal than an email. Many times as teachers, when we are trying to formally communicate with our older students, we may have an informal conversation with them first um, and then perhaps follow up with an email. And so trying to transition our students into being able to have typed discussions with us that are not quite as formal as the email that is, you know, I haven't seen any of your work in the past few days. Um, and just more of the, the feedback and the conversation that you would have um, in a classroom where sometimes you can have sort of a, a private one on one conversation within the classroom. And that's a little harder on, you know, a Google Meet. Um, with Zoom, you do have the breakout room option. So it's a little easier that way. Um, and then also the, uh, the happy hour, the K-12 version of that is class parties. <laughs> uh, so we very much had that. Uh, we had a great art teacher who did, you know, kind of an edible art um, idea with the students and they all made their breads and then they took pictures of them. But the, uh, one of the final days was they all came and ate their bread together. Um, I used to do those with my high school students when we were having literature discussions. Um, we did a study on Nadine Gordimer's short stories, and she's a South African author, so I would always make a lot of South African tea and breads and cakes and things like that and bring them into class, and the kids would eat as we discussed literature. So in this way, I will send them, you know, recipes see if they want to cook at home or they can just bring an alternative and then we we eat and we chat and we have like a little book talk coffee talk that's very informal um, and then sometimes like Paul said sometimes it's just talking about us and where we are and it really is not curriculum driven um, and the purpose of that is so that it the next thing can be curriculum driven we need to create that sense of community and belonging first with our students um, Connecting virtually, students are, you know, they're experts on it. That's what they do outside of school. Um, it's Twitter, TikTok, Amino, whatever it is. Kids, um, the kids are experts on it, and we can really tap into that as educators, and we can, you know, connect with them virtually the way they know how to connect. Um, using things, I mentioned Flipgrid before, so you can do a bit of video conferencing with them. Um, writing conferences, um, using Google Docs where there are shared docs and you're using the chat options in there. Um, having all 20 kids or 27 kids on one Google Doc can be complicated, but if you set up a template 
and give them a, each an individualized place where they're working um, and they can go back and chat. I, am, I have my students share documents with each other and give each other peer feedback. Um, using actively learn where you're getting um, the immediate feedback for the students about if they're answering the correct questions correctly or not. Um, using things like Newsella or Nearpod. Many times we keep our Google Meet on, the audio on while students were working and I could talk to them. So it's kind of using that gaming idea where students are gaming together and they all have their audio and they can talk back and forth um, as they're looking at a screen. Um, so we did a lot of, of that idea as well, whether it was, you know, uh, literary term jeopardy, <laughs> just trying to make it more like what we perhaps would have done in the classroom where it, it's building that sense of community for them. Um, and as far as, you know, the writing process and being able to do writing conferences, that was something that I really struggled with online. Uh, I didn't have that one-on-one -on -one time with my students because you, you do have these safety limitations in K-12 where, you know, you shouldn't really be in a video conference one-on-one -on -one with just one student at a time. Um, so we did a lot of things with Turnitin, uh, using the multi-draft submissions, using uh, PeerMark, where the students were able to give peer feedback to each other. Uh, I gave them a lot of voice notes um, and using the quick marks and, and rubric launching, and I'm sure Kristen's going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but then I'll, I would take that and then allow the students to do a video reflection for me. What did they learn when they were reading through all the, the feedback that I gave to them? And that was a, a really nice way of kind of substituting the writing conference. Um, and I could get their tone on how they were feeling about what they received and they could hear my tone of my intention. Um, especially with things like the voice comments um, and they could, you know, get that feeling behind it that was, and I think somebody wrote this here in the chat, like hyper positivity, uh, just giving them lots and lots of encouragement. Um, it's an isolating experience and the more encouragement we can give our students in their learning, the better they will do. Great, thank you. Yeah, so it's all connected, right? The easier we can communicate with students by kind of breaking down the formal barriers that are set, making it more informal to also helps create that safe space. And it's almost impossible to summarize everything, all of the wonderful ideas you're all sharing. Uh, so thank you. So my next question is for Dr. Sparks. And I'm hoping that you can help us bridge to a larger focus on technology. So remote, remote learning settings require technology, no question there. So how can we really take advantage of this opportunity and leverage technology in a way to connect with our students? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, I think many people have, have seen the, the past four months as uh, uh, a, a bit of a tragedy. I, I, I see it d differently. This has been an amazing time <clears throat> to, uh, to have people get really serious about implementing technology, right? <laughs> it, it was is forced in some regard, but um, what an exciting time. Uh, if we can, just imagine for a moment that school, your school's all shut down and you had no access to the internet. Uh, it's a pretty dire sort of situation. I, I don't know how we would do that, uh, you know, th through the postal system or, uh, or or something else. So in reality, it's it's really quite a blessing. This uh, this ecosystem of technology that we have around and it's, it's so rich. It's changing every day. And uh, I used to do a little exercise for my students and say, "Hey, let's try to keep up on all the new media that are being created." And it, it's it's just really impossible. So I, I think um, I, I think it's important to, again, focus on, on the important stuff. I'll come back to technology in, in just a moment. But um, Mimi Ito is, a, uh, I'm a big fan of Mimi Ito. She uh, kind of exploded onto the scene of, of learning maybe eight to 10 years ago. And, and she wasn't an educator at all. She was an ethnologist. And she she got a grant from the MacArthur Foundation to go see what students are, what, what adolescents are doing with technology when adults aren't there telling them what to do. So 
that's an interesting proposition, right? And she, she found, and she's written a book and uh, she started a, a little uh, organization called Connected Learning, interestingly enough, Connected Learning. And the, the big ideas she came away with were these, we, these three, which uh, has formed a, an acronym I'll, I'll follow along with here is uh, HOMAGO. So the first thing she found that students, that adolescents do, and kids do with technology, is they form their little community, a, a place where they can feel so safe, their, their friends and their, their peeps, right? The, the, the people that they hang out with, that's very important. And she also found that they don't really go past that point, or they, they can't go past that point until that's settled. It's very important. Well, I think we can see this, happening in school classrooms people you know the students just normally want to connect in in groups that they uh they can work with and identify with the second thing was they like to mess around with technologies and they challenge each other you know hey, let's use this and let's use this and let's see if we can't uh, work you know work whatever media it is better and become uh expert at that medium so there's Hanging out, which is building your community, messing around, which is getting comfortable with the tools. And then the final piece was geeking out. At this point, students actually start to produce things and, and, and get engaged in the larger uh, uh, elements, uh, start working uh, to, to, to write things or, or be engaged at, at a, a larger community level online. So there's hanging out, messing around, and geeking out. This is an important transition. And what Imimi Ito has done is said, let's take how students naturally interact and try to bring that back to school. So that to the extent that, in, in, in honor of our, our topic today, uh, whatever we do with technology, we should be aware of how humans learn and how kids think and, and, and realize that we're a part of the ecology, as Julie was saying, that, that they are uh, actually, in many cases, better experts at than, than we are. So that's, that's a really important piece of this, is to always keep the humanity uh, focused and realize how, how humans learn and not, not uh, automatically uh, react and go back to our safe place, which is, all right, we're going to have a class, we're going to push the information forward, and the students will walk away smarter. So, so that's, that's one big idea. Um, also, um, there's uh, the, the latest learning theory out there that I'm aware of is Siemens and Downs connectivism, which basically posits that knowledge is the network and learning is building your network, right? So if you think about that for a moment, that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, our world has changed. It used to be with Jeopardy, right? The game show, you had to know the answer so well that you could pose it in the form of a question. Nowadays, game shows, you get to ask a friend, you get to ask the audience, right? Our world has changed. It's much more collaborative. And so, this this new learning theory connectivism is is the idea that we're part of a ecosystem and our job as as uh, as teachers as educators can be this little narrow focus which like all right i'm a little slice of their ecosystem and in this slice i'm going to be pushing information about math or or a writing whatever that is or we can expand our role to be kind of more of a a manager or a guide through through what they're seeing, right? Um, I, I guide through the in the connected learning, the networked world, and how they can make sense of all of that. So I think that's that's very very important. Um, and finally, there are so many new technologies. Uh, it will require all of us to get involved and and play around with it. So, the idea going forward is not how do I pick the exactly the right technology to use with my students. It's to grab something and go with it, explore it, write about it, share it with others. If it works, 
then then go for it. If, if it doesn't, there's going to be a new technology right behind. So I, I think that's a more appropriate strategy for educators going forward and for employing technology. The technology is always going to change. What's not going to change is how students learn, how we as humans learn, and and we need to support that. And to, to the extent that we do and we clue in and we, we get that and we provide safe spaces uh, for students to to learn and we provide social and emotional support for that, then it will be successful. Thank you, Chris. Yes, thank you, Dr. Sparks. Um, I know we're we're at time and we do still have some questions. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly just share a few uh, feedback studio features that support some of the goals that we're talking about today. And then if anyone can stay over the hour a little bit, we will have a few minutes. We're gonna go over, if that's okay, Andy, to address a few of the questions. Okay, so um, first, uh, just leaning in the topic of leveraging technology, um, a few ways that Feedback Studio supports this, we have some quick mark comments, and these, you may or may not already be using these in your classroom. These are sets of comments that are organized by topic. They're drag and drop comments, so it helps keep feedback consistent. They're also time-saving um, because they're, they're already there for you, and it also gives you more opportunities to leave feedback more often. Um, and your accounts come with quick mark sets uh, ready to go, as well as you can create your own, share them with colleagues, also to create kind of consistency is there as well. Voice comments, another great way to connect with students. Just hearing a teacher's voice shows a different level of care. I know that was some of the strategies mentioned earlier today. And I've seen some really creative ideas with voice comments, such as educators actually creating a quick mark comment that says, go to the, listen to the two minute mark and dragging that on the paper. And in the two minute mark, it explains a little bit more feedback that they maybe thought would be better said verbally instead of textually on um, a quick mark. Uh, but most commonly, educators use them to provide a summary of feedback on um, student work as well. And then rubrics, we have uh, several rubrics available in Feedback Studio. Accounts come uh, with a set of rubrics, but similar to the quick mark sets, they can be created, they can be manipulated, the ones that are in there as well. My favorite feature with our rubrics is that you can actually tie a comment to a rubric criteria and show it shows students exactly why they uh, scored the way they did. And that certain criteria, you can see there's little bubbles on that rubric image there. Uh, and I, we have some more resource, resources that I will share a link um, in a minute uh, to, to, to where you can download some more rubrics and quick mark sets. And then next, sorry, I'm trying to, I know we're, we're at time here. Um, so as we're in the spirit of remote learning, I'd like to share a remote learning website. This is um, a web link that Andy, if you wouldn't mind sharing in the chat window for everyone, but the web link is also at the top. This is a website that hosts pedagogical and training type of videos called Vidbits also downloadable resources and best practices for supporting educators in remote settings. So please take a look at that for some more information. Great, thanks so much for that great conversation, everyone. Really appreciate you going through some of those, you know, those key feedback studio features as well, Kristen. So yeah, we have some really good questions coming in. I know we're at time, but um, I want to address a couple quickly. So um, Ram has a question for the panelists. Most of the students seem too frustrated with the lockdowns and each one situation at home could be different in terms of stress or support. How can a teacher get to understand what the student is going through on an online platform? I'll take that one. Um, I, I, using online tools is uh, very useful. Let's say if you're able to use something like Pear Deck, um, or Pear Deck, I should probably say being able to have the students kind of gauge where they're at you can kind of um, uh, do a poll where are you what are you feeling at this particular point now no one else will know uh, as far as other students will know where how the students are feeling but you as a teacher will be able to see what's going on with the other students 
Um, you can use a mood meter. Um, there's a book called Permission to Feel. We were actually looked at it in our ILT. That's by Mark Brackett. Um, and Mark Brackett had four quadrants in terms of how not only students, but adults and how they can feel. And they had four different colors. Uh, so you can probably take some words from out of that bracket and kind of uh, place on a poll and then have students drag and have them interact. How are you feeling today? Take one, or, take one word, just four simple words, one from each of the quadrants. And you can kind of gauge where those particular students are at. And if a student is consistently, let's say you're using uh, a word that's in the red and you have some concerns, hopefully your uh, school has a process in terms of getting that particular student some assistance and help that they may need. Um, that goes through the counselor or whatever resources you may have at that particular school. Um, and that's one way to do it in terms of polling your students. Um, another way you can do it is through writing. Julie talked about the writing piece. So being able to have students kind of write, give them certain topics uh, and have them reflect. And if you create that safe space, the students will write and tell you exactly what's going on in their lives. So being able to provide them the opportunity and doing it consistently, not writing once every three weeks or every four weeks, but you know, having them write little samples, maybe once, twice a week, uh, just doing it consistently in terms of how they're feeling. And that's the focus there. So do it in that particular way. And that could be done as warm ups, or that could be done um, in the middle of class as a, okay, let's check in and see how you're feeling about the assignment and overall how you're feeling. So being able to get the temperature there. So there's several ways you can go about it, but those are two ways you can do it rather quickly within your classroom time that's given. I would also add, sorry, <laughs> I would also add to that, um, when you're doing your synchronous time, if you are able to, to try and be, you know, one of the first ones to log on and one of the last ones to leave. Sometimes I'd have students that would go on there earlier on purpose because they wanted to ask me something or reach out to me with a need that they had um, that they didn't necessarily want everyone to hear. So they wanted to be on there one or two minutes before everybody, or they'd stay on after uh, to either tell me something about their day or, you know, something that, that was troubling them. I, I had a student who all of his internet was on their generator. You know, they needed their generator on every day to be able to have electricity, to be able to have internet. Um, so he said to me, you know what, is it okay if I do some more asynchronous stuff and just email it to you once I'm done rather than staying online? And of course, you know what, just being adaptable, but also being there for the students. It's much like that idea of when we're at school, they know where to find us. They know where our offices are. They know where our classrooms are. Um, and they know when to pop in. Maybe they used to pop in at lunchtime to talk to you about stuff or having those either online office hours or just hanging out on either end of that synchronous learning time. And, and just to add, since, uh, that since writing is, is sometimes uh, problematic, using technology to allow students to communicate in, in, in as a podcast or, you know, a, a video or an audio feed, uh, there's, there's lots of different ways to, uh, to communicate. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you all so much. So in, in, since we're over, I think we're going to wrap up today's webinar, but I just want to take a quick uh, pause to really thank our panelists today. Thank you all so much for joining us and really providing some really great best practices that hopefully, you know, the attendees can kind of run with and implement at their own uh, schools and institutions. And thank you all so much for, for joining us today, all, all of the attendees. And a special shout out to Kristen for being such a great moderator. So again, thank you all so much. We'll send out the recording, you know, in 24 to 48 hours. And we hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.